Welcome to a special re-release episode of Kick-Ass Career Conversations. This week, we're revisiting an incredible conversation with Phoebe Leona, an inspiring embodiment guide and founder of the Nomad Collective. We're bringing this episode out of the archives because Phoebe's insights on reinvention, empowerment, and belonging are more relevant now than ever. In this episode, Phoebe shares her transformative journey from professional dancer to empowering leader. We delve into the powerful shift from entitlement to empowerment, exploring how to reclaim personal power through somatic practices and the importance of celebrating our small victories along the way. This discussion is packed with timeless wisdom on overcoming failure, embracing our true selves, and using our bodies as gateways to deeper self-awareness and strength. Join us as we revisit Phoebe's incredible story story, and practical strategies to foster empowerment and purpose in our lives. Now let's dive back in. I know I got totally caught off guard there. I'm dealing with blueberries. <laughs> I am dealing with blueberries right now, folks. This is what is happening live and in person. But welcome to Kick Ass Career Conversation. It's Friday. Apparently, I'm doing my grocery shopping at the same time. It's called multitasking. You know that woman who does the reels? It's it's um it's manifesting. Look it up. It's multitasking. Look it up. It's gonna be my thing. Hi, I'm Kim. <laughs> Hi, I'm Louise. And, and we're joined today by. Phoebe. Yay. <laughs> Phoebe, we're so glad you're here. Um, and yes, we are this uh, relaxed and just kind of chill and going with the flow every week. That's how we show up here. Um, we also show up here every week at the start talking about what we're celebrating. So what are we celebrating this week? Mm. Um. <laughs> Being alive. We're celebrating. Being alive. <laughs> Some days, that's that's a great celebration, right? Getting out of bed, we can celebrate that. Um, I'm going to, I've had a tough week, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, my body is not doing the things that I would like it to do. Um, with recovering from knee replacement surgery, it's been a challenge. Uh, and uh, yet I will lean into celebrating my body today, uh, right? Uh, I have to recognize all the hard work that it's doing inside, um, healing from major surgery. Uh, even though I can't show up in a way that I really, really like to, um, it's okay. My energy is just being funneled to a different place uh, for a really great cause. Uh, so mm-hmm. I just need to lean into that a whole lot um, this weekend for sure. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's where I'm at today. (sighs) Well, Hollis just sent you some love. Hi Hollis. Thank you for joining (laughs) us and sending some love to Louise. I think we're all doing that right now for sure. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Phoebe? What are you celebrating today? Oh my gosh. I'm celebrating failure. (laughs) I'm celebrating leaning into the fears, you know, on a personal level, I, um, I'm doing a test with my new boyfriend. We're living together for a week, well, actually 10 days to see if like in this one bedroom, not ideal situation, and just to see, do we still like each other at the end? And not to say that that's been the failure, but I'm also going through a lot in my own professional life where there are things that look like failure. And to just, you know, I had one morning where he saw me real and raw and I was just crying on his floor. <laughs> I said, you're getting me at a really interesting time right now. And I'm not normally like this, but I think that if we can both meet each other in this space of um, making mistakes and failure, uh, we can do anything together. So I'm celebrating that, that we still like each other in day five. I think we're day five in, so. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> That's a huge yeah. thing. And yeah. I love, right? Absolutely celebrate the failures. Like we don't do that enough. We absolutely don't celebrate yeah. the failures enough. 
Um, I was on a conversation with somebody earlier today and she said she looks for the failures because she has learned mm -hmm. that every time she goes through a failure, it's not about coming out stronger, right? I think as particularly since on the screen right now, we're all women, it's, I, I think we have that tendency to feel like we need to come out stronger, but we come mm -hmm. out wiser. If we've learned something, we've, we've, something has changed inside of us. And so allowing for that space for that to happen, whether it's like a, a physical thing that is now new in your body, that your body is going, I don't want this. Um, whether it is things in your life or your business deciding to show up in a way that is more than crunchy, um, allowing ourselves to be in that space. I know um, there's nothing super challenging going on for me right now that I would be like, ah, and I can feel cosmically, collectively, we are, in, I think a lot of people are in that space right now. I mean, we're about to be in a place where, what is it? Seven planets are going to be retrograde. All oh, the same time. crying out loud. <laughs> Sorry, Louise. I know it never ends. It never ends. There's always something in retrograde. I have my hands full with Mercury when it's in retrograde. <laughs> yeah, and well, it's, it's, it's going to be one of them. <laughs> yeah, it is going to be one of them. That's coming up at the end of August. So um, it is, I, I got done with my day yesterday and there was no big, it was a fine day. It was a lovely day. I got done. I went downstairs and it was like, I just looked at my daughter and I said, I am just here to make every weird noise and gyration with my body that I can, because apparently I just have to do this to get it out. Right. Phoebe, I know like I'm speaking your language right there. Yeah. It is just it, like, so I guess what I'm celebrating is the ability to lean into that and just be in the, in the moment of whatever weirdness I'm feeling I'm aware of it enough that I can let it out. So it's not taking over. Um, I just came through a period where I felt like so much was taking over. And so I don't want that again, please. Thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, letting it out, letting it out. Well, we're here. Let's do a collective deep breath because we're here together. We are just here together and we are here with some beautiful human beings that I know are checking in. I see Hollis. I see Sage. I see my lovely husband, Danny, who is stuck at Pearson Airport right now. So, you know, all the things and so many more people that are joining us. So welcome, welcome. We have celebrated and now we're going to learn a little bit about Phoebe and we're going to find out more about kind of how you got to where you are and where you're headed so i'm going to share <laughs> your bio with the world so phoebe's mission in life is to offer people deeper experiences of themselves so they have greater sense of purpose and belonging in the world she's done this in many creative ways as an author a tedx speaker contemporary dancer yoga teacher entrepreneur and embodiment guide and leader as the founder of the Nomad Collective and co-founder of Tribe Military Yoga, Phoebe teaches leaders how to lead with empathy and heart-centered guide, heart guides how to step into their power. She's been on diverse stages as a dancer, speaker, teacher from Times Square New Year's Eve celebration to the USMA at West Point to Regeneron Pharm Pharmaceuticals. She is passionate about sharing her own embodiment practice known as Movement 109, Got to check it out. It's amazing. And it guides people to better understand how to handle the pressures of life and negate burnout, overwhelm, and get out of survival mode. So, right, all that stuff we were just kind of talking about. You can listen to Phoebe on her own podcast, The Space in Between, and read her most recent book, Dear Radiant One, An Emotional Recovery Story and Transformational Guide to Embody the Dance of Life. Phoebe, we are so, so glad you're here. I know Louise has a question before you jump in and start talking. Okay. That's all good. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, you're reading. Uh, how, I want actually my first question for you, Phoebe, is like, how does it feel to hear Kim read your bio and all of those things that are you? 
<laughs> yeah, it's funny because I have so many versions of that bio. And I was thinking, oh, that's the one she's reading. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Um, especially when I was just talking about the, the failure, you know, being at this sort of bottom place of the universe is asking me, what do you want to become now? And that was really beautiful. And I feel honored to hear that and reflect that back right now, because um, when we start something new, we don't have to, you know, there's the saying of like, don't throw out the water with the, you know, the bathwater with the baby or baby with the bathwater. There we go. Um, and, and it is, it's, it's always this integration and this up level. So all of these things that, you know, a lot of people have said to me, you know, I don't understand who you are and, and what you're doing because you have so many dots out here in the world, dancer, yoga teacher, which kind of, you can kind of see the similarities, but also working with the military and doing corporate work. And in, in my mind, it all makes sense because everything is connected. So uh, that's part of the journey. And that's what I love about what I do in this world is I get to put a dot in there that might seem really random and connect it to everything else. And so it's really fun to hear it in that container and remember, oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to bring some of those dots with me when I when I start anew. <laughs> Has that always been the way, like when you think about like your own career journey, like, you know, even from a kid, when you imagined what you would do in the world of work, um, has it always been that like, just kind of reinventing and pausing and reinventing again? Tell us more about mm -hmm. that. I love that question because in a sense, no, because when I, I was born dancing <laughs> and my mom would always joke that I was I was bouncing in my jolly jumper and dancing before I was walking and so that was always just inside of me that I was going to be a dancer uh, so I had this very one-pointed focus on that track so I learned okay you go to college you go to New York City you audition so there was this one track and this one focus but at the same time this other word that came into um, my vocabulary at a, a rather young age was choreographer. And this whole idea of being able to see something on a bigger scale, because a choreographer has this vision and they can see a bird's eye view of the space, you know, the space, the people, the movements, and, you know, the formations that they're making and all the other aspects of the costume and the lighting design. And maybe there's, you know, some sort of scenery if that's part of their, their vision. So there are all these little pieces and parts that bring together this one piece. Um, and that's what really excited me. So now that I see my life, you know, in retrospect and seeing all of these different aspects of self, I have been a choreographer. You know, some people said, you know, might see it as, oh, I retired from dance at, you know, in my thirties formally um, in the professional sense. Um, but I really feel that I've kept that that heartbeat of being a choreographer throughout my entire life. And it just looks a lot different than what I thought it was going to be. It often does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Louise. Well, no, I just love, I love the thread, right? Like when we can take some time to kind of like identify what the thread is and what we've uh, woven in our careers professionally. And, and mm -hmm. that thread often doesn't change. I, I don't think anyways, throughout our lives, because it is when we're kind of just living in alignment with who we are, um, that thread gets pulled through and, and we can, it looks like reinvention on the outside, but really I think it's more refinement on the inside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that resonates to me, that refinement. I, I know that just even in my business, people were trying to put me in a box because I most recently came from the nonprofit sector. And I was like, N -n -n no, <laughs> please don't put me in a box, first of all. But second of all, like, there's so much. My background in entertainment, in theater, in film, it, right? And you were talking about that, that purview of being a, a choreographer. And I think about being a director and a writer and seeing right? All of the elements and being a stage manager and how does it then come together into production? Um, all of those elements that we pull forward for ourselves 
are unique to us that nobody sees outside of us because they can only see that most recent or, you know, the resume version of ourselves. And so being in that place of reinvention, being in that place of kind of finding yourself anew, again, thinking about those threads that you're pulling forward, is that is that kind of the space that you're in or are you just blossoming into what what's next? Mm, I think a little bit of both. I mean, I definitely feel the thread. And when Louise was talking, I was seeing this, this thread that was going on a linear timeline, but there was a lot of shape shifting around it, right? This the energies, these, okay, I'm playing this role now and now I'm going this role and shape shifting. And I feel... I feel that 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 is going to continue that thread and the shape shifting, but there is something new too that I haven't even imagined yet. And it might be another shape shifting, or it might be that the thread like frays and goes into all these different directions. Mm -hmm. I have no idea, but that's part of the great mystery of just and leaning into it and being curious and being playful in the space of co-creation because you have to have that deep sense of trust and faith that whatever wants to be born is going to come through you in a way that's going to align with your highest good. And right now I have no idea. I'm very mushy. I keep saying I'm in the chrysalis. I'm so mushy. I have no idea <laughs> what I want to become yet. <laughs> Just what does that feel like? I mean, right? Being it because I think a lot of people could probably relate to that feeling of I don't know. I don't know. Um, what is that feeling like for you being in that space? Well, I'm gonna bring in the word that I know we're gonna talk about two words later. It, mm -hmm. This word of empowerment has shifted. Um, being in this space because I've been in this space many times. I think the the last time was 10 years ago when I'm on this kind of bigger scale, when I was going through the, the death of my father and a divorce and leaving my job and everything. And I was very mushy there and I was a hot mess. And the one thing that I didn't feel I had was my power. And I felt like everything was happening to me. And I had to really just deeply surrender in this space that just I felt very desperate. I felt like I was so out of control. And I mean, even, even at the depth of that, I felt like I was going to be supported, but I, I, I didn't fully trust it. Like I, I knew something was going to happen, but I didn't fully trust it. And this time here I am about 10 years later going through another transformation. I have that, that word empowerment. Like I feel like I know who I am now. I know who I know what my heartbeat is, what my why is, is that I'm here to help people create a space for their sense of belonging and purpose. I'm here to offer transformational experiences in some way for that, to, to facilitate that transformation for themselves. And I know that I'm truly aligned with that. I know my heartbeat. Um, but now I don't, ha I can let go of the, the what and the how. I know you're really big on that, Kim, of letting go of the how. And I do have this really deep sense of faith and trust. And that comes from feeling empowered because I know even though there might've been mistakes that I made and failures along the line, I don't regret any of them. I'm not looking back and going, oh, you know, I, yeah, would I do things a little differently? Yeah, but I know who I am now and it's, it's, it's happening for me. It's happening mm -hmm. through me as opposed to that happening to me. And that's where the empowerment comes. Yeah, it is interesting. So we are talking about moving from this place of entitlement to empowerment. And I'm curious if, if we went to that place of entitlement, where did that show up in your life before you started to understand what it felt like to be empowered? Hmm. It's interesting because I don't align with that word all that much. Entitled. I think most people bristle when they're like, I'm not entitled. <laughs> but I mean, I do, I do see it because I know I had certain expectations of what my life should look like. Yeah. Um, but just to give you sort of the understanding of why I said I don't feel that was because I grew up in a very upper middle class, you know, area outside of Washington, DC, but I was very much lower middle class. And I, 
you know, we were on welfare for a period of time. And so just from that, like that experience and being through that, but then I also had a lot of childhood trauma that I held in and hid from people. And I saw this other life outside of myself where everything looked perfect and, you know, beautiful families and everything. So, but I saw that, you know, my mom always used this word about people from DC, no offense to anybody, cause I'm from there. But she said, you know, everybody in DC, they're just so entitled because they do walk around with this, you know, socioeconomic status and the way that things should be. And it's just, everything's perfect. Everything's manicured. And if it's out of alignment, um, you know, they have a hissy fit. And I never felt that I was that, that way because whatever I was given, I was very grateful for it. Um, so that's why I say I don't, I don't really align with it. But with that said, yes, as I walked through my path, there were certain ways where I thought I had the expectation. I had an intention and I also had expectations that came with it. Like I do a lot of work. I should get this. I deserve this, right? Um, and I've had a lot of really angry conversations with, with God and universe, <laughs> like mm -hmm. what the hell? <laughs> um, so that shift, and I feel like it's been rather recent. I mean, I was really angry actually in the, the project that we did together, Kim, <laughs> side note, um, with the embodied leadership, it was so successful. But there were aspects that I saw as failure. And I was just like, God, you didn't meet me where I was supposed to, right? And I had to go to this very deep surrender and say, okay, here we are. Um, what, what, it, what was this for? What's the gift here? What's the lesson? If I'm not getting what I expected or what it should look like, um, what is this truly for? And I think that's really when I started to step into my power because I was giving it away. I was, I was expecting something outside of myself, whether it be the people showing up or the universe supporting me. Um, I took my power back and said, well, what can I do here now? Mm -hmm. That has shifted a lot. What do I have control over and not feel like guilty um, about the things that didn't happen or what should have happened? Yeah, yeah. oh, that should work. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think like for me, that entitlement word, um, it's it's when when I get hooked in the past, when I've got hooked on that outcome, right? When I am just like focused and it's like, this is what needs to happen, should be happening. Why the hell is it not happening, right? Like we get so hooked on, on what that next thing is that we forget um, all of the other things around it. And we do really much give our power away. I think in entitlement, actually, like we could relabel that to, to be about giving your power away because it's all of a sudden, it's the thing that becomes important, right? The destination or the outcome. Um, and that's kind of what I see. And, and empowered, I think, should be in power right? Because that's really where we are more in control um, at, 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 getting, at getting what we want. It's, I, I don't know that it's about changing our expectation because it's about crafting our expectation to be within our control instead of giving all our power away. That's a really interesting way, way to look at it. it. So what I love here is because I talk, I do talk about entitlement a lot. Um, I talk about it inside my family a lot. I'm like, <laughs> um, not that necessarily the people in my family are showing up as entitled. It's let's not live a life that, that we believe that we're entitled. Um, and yet there is that aspect of, and you both touched on it, is I deserve this. Just by being human, I deserve this. And by believing in that, there is a level of entitlement, right? I am a human being, so I deserve grace, courtesy, and good things to happen to me. Does that mean that I'm entitled? Yeah, it, I think it actually does. It, it lends itself to like you just said, is, is something to happen to me or for me versus me being in my power. I love that empowered, creating and crafting it for myself on my terms. 
So I do, I, I'm really enjoying this, this thought of entitlement as actually giving away your power and being empowered is right. It is, it's the reclamation of that for ourselves um, in all the different levels. And so now that we kind of have a little bit of language here that, that we've landed on, in what ways do we see the struggle in bringing back that power from that place where we're giving it away in entitlement and bringing it back to ourselves and empowered? Like what, what is the challenge with doing that? Mm. I'm looking down on my notes because I did a little journaling and it was interesting. I, let me just read it. I don't know if it'll be your answer. Um, there's a deeper understanding of holding one space in relationship to other. And what I feel is when we're in, like what I was envisioning, envisioning was space and how we hold space. And so what we were just all talking about is when we're in that place of entitlement, we're holding our space, but with this container of expectation of some kind and that we deserve and that we should. Um, and there's not a lot of space for other, right? In the co-creation of that. But then when I was thinking of empowerment, well, how is that different in terms of how you hold space is thinking, when you're in that space of power, you're not only in the space of power to have power over other people, but you're actually in space of holding power to empower others. It's that ripple effect. And so we invite in other in that space of empowerment. And that's what really excited me there was there was not just, it's not about me if I'm entitled or if I'm empowered, but it becomes a, a we. And there is that struggle and going, using, going back to the word of the idea of struggle, there is that struggle of changing the, the narrative of moving from me to we. And we want to hold on to our beliefs. We want to hold on to the things that we, you know, and like, oh, this is my story. I don't really want to involve other people here. <laughs> yep. I deserve this, right? So it's, the, it's that deep surrendering of letting go of what should be or could be and knowing that actually these people that are in your space are actually here to co-create with you and they're not here to fight you and claim more of your space. Um, and the other word that came through is this, I was in, from the two is what I felt was appreciation and gratitude. There's not a lot of, there, I don't feel there's a lot of space in entitlement for appreciated and appreciation and gratitude because it's always like, and the next thing, I'm entitled to the next thing and the next thing. And when you're in that space of power, it's, you usually have some sort of journey behind you to look back and go, wow, I, I overcame a lot and I can be grateful for what I have now and appreciate what I have. And how can I open up the, the circle for others um, to appreciate and be in gratitude of what they have? So, so is the key then like through experience? Cause like when we talk about entitlement, I'm, I think about, uh, some young people in my life who, who are, who very much fall into that camp of, um, of entitlement. Um, the things they do, the things they say, uh, their own expectations of what, um, I, I owe them or the world owes to them. And so when I think about like this, this transition, I'm thinking about those young people in my life just to say, what is the, the transformation that I can help foster to get through from that space into this empowered space and right and, and getting back that control. And so is that through experience and like, 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 understanding hardship or, or understanding a, a, that a challenge can be overcome? Like, what is the, what's the hurdle that, that a person has to go through to, to come into that, like empowerment and, and getting that power for themselves? Oh my God. I want to dig into this, but I don't know if Kim 
Can yeah, I go. Go forward. I feel I'm seeing so many threads of conversations I've been having in the past week. Um, but it's particularly the younger generation that you're speaking into of this entitlement. I think one, our world is set up to isolate and we're just on our phone and we're, we're not having to be responsible for our actions or, or how we're affecting other people because we're here and just, you know, yeah. doing all of our stuff. So we don't have that experience as you spoke into. I also think that it is a response to not feeling safe. Right. I can't care for anybody else if I don't have my needs met. So my needs are probably, you know, on the basic level, my survival needs, but then we layer it on with all the other things, like the things that we need to have in order to unconsciously or consciously feel safe. So I need to have a really nice car to drive in so I feel safe to drive to work, or I need to have really nice clothes so that I'm accepted by my friends, right? So we can look at that, even that is seen as a survival. So I, I, I'm a big, you know, everybody knows here, I'm an embodiment guide, I teach somatic work, and I know you both are involved in that too. So how can we let them feel safe in their bodies and, and to be okay with not having, right, and to be here and truly be empowered in their body and connect with others. And the other thread that I was, um, a conversation I've been having with a few different circles is, um, this idea that we don't have the rite of passage anymore. I mean, we do in some cultures, like I know, Kim, you just, your daughter just had the bat mitzvah mm -hmm. and we have that in some cultures, but but generally in our Western world, we don't have this sense of, of a rite of passage with, like we used to, we don't have ceremony. And I was watching, sorry to like, just give, you know, I got this from Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do it. I didn't do like a deep dive research project on this, but I saw a guy on Instagram, but it really spoke to me because there was a lot of truth here. He was saying when teens go, and I'm kind of going off, but it, it, it'll come back to what we're talking about. He was saying when teens are going through this experience of dying, right, from child, they're transitioning from childhood to adulthood. They actually need some sort of ceremony and race of passage or some sort of mentor to say, yeah, what you're going through is normal, right? But we have just put everything down. We pushed everything down. And so whatever they're feeling metaphorically, it's really more, more metaphorically, there is a death, but they, there tends to be like this, you know, physical, they take the physical, literal um, idea of it. And there's, you know, teenage suicide, but, but why I brought that to it, because I feel that we have lost that deep sense of first connection to our body, connection to other, and then connection to the journey, the experience of the journey. And there are hardships, like you said, Louise, and there, and I think that that does help when you can look back and say, I, you know, I've gone through all of this. Um, I can feel from that place of power rather than I should be having this and that, right? because really that is an act of of fear. Well, so much of this is fear, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when we go to that place of I deserve, it should be this way. It's we're, we're afraid of what the other outcome is. We're afraid of what it means about us. We're afraid of what people will think of us, right? They have it. I don't. What does that mean about me? Am I a failure to get back to mm -hmm. that F word? Right. Which we did a whole episode on, on the, on the other F word failure a couple weeks ago. Okay. It's that, it's that, that terrifying place, that place in the chrysalis of I'm just muck and everybody else has it all together. Right. All their shit is together. I'm heartened by the fact that our daughter, who is 13, is sitting downstairs with her 13-year-old friend, both of them with their, their, you know, fuzzy bunnies and their, you know, lovey snuggly things on their laps while they're playing video games together. And I'm like, yeah, because at 13, that's what, in my opinion, absolutely, there is nothing else that you need to be doing. Right? And it's both of those worlds. It's the, I have my, I have my stuffy <laughs> and I have my more adult leaning video game that I'm playing. 
right? It's this, it's that beautiful synergy that happens when they're at that amazing age. And Louise, I, I love the the question of like, in what ways can we help facilitate that more gentle entry from or exit from this place of entitlement that can so easily happen into that place of empowerment? And um, I mean, I, I agree that the body is a, is a great gateway. Like when we can get ourselves back to our bodies, we're not just I, right? We have, we have sovereignty. We're not giving up sovereignty, but we get back to our tissues, our blood, our, our bones, our, well, some of us have pieces that don't belong in there, but they <laughs> belong in there now. <laughs> um, and, and we're all made up that way. And that's how we're also the we. Mm -hmm. Well, and that I think even goes back to like this, this missing rites of passage, mm -hmm. right? This, this physicality, usually that's what that is, right? This, 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 um, transformation our bodies go through, um, and come out differently the other side. And we don't see that in young folks, right? We don't see the rites of passage, even of leaving home in your first apartment, right? Like mm -hmm. all of these things get really, really hard. What we would consider, right? This, this transformation, um, or this, this launching pad towards empowerment, right? Um, and so it is, it, it's really tough. And I think like Kim, as you were talking, um, I believe we often think like this entitlement path, right? Like this very, like, this is where it is. This is the outcome. This is what I should be doing. This is what I should be getting. This is what I deserve. It is, it does feel very safe, right? And it feels very like, uh, I'm threatening, um, because this is the, the very path that, that I should be able to take. And yet it's so, um, it, yeah. <laughs> it's disempowering, mm -hmm. right? We have to be in the fringes. We have to be on the shoulders of the road to really experience and to really know and understand our own limits. Otherwise, we just become so narrow. Um, we don't even know our own capacity and our own abilities um, because we're just like so here on this one path doing this one thing. And if it doesn't work, it's somebody else's fault, right? Um, we need to turn both the shoulders for sure. I think that's why the gig economy and entrepreneurship is so much on the rise, right? Because if we take this back to our careers, so many people are like, I did that path and I didn't get what I deserved. Mm -hmm. So they're taking back that empowerment and they're mm -hmm. attempting to go down. I think the, the misstep there is as they're heading down that path is there's also this feeling of, and now I'm doing it this way and I'm entitled to the outcome that I deserve, right? And that it, it's like, but no, <laughs> yeah. we don't know what that outcome is gonna be. It's an experiment. Just because millions of people have been entrepreneurs in whatever way before you doesn't mean that you're going to have the same outcome right? That's the sovereignty part. That's the bring that empowerment back to yourself and make it your own, right? So that you can create that new path or be on those shoulders uh, as you were talking about, Louise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my, my experience lately with kind of this, this empowerment and, and, and using your, your body to kind of manifest that is all through my improv experiment that I did, right? And to be actually be able to use your body to connect to something deeper, um, terrifying uh, beyond belief, um, <laughs> so empowering. Um, yeah, it, and, and it is about using your body to get over. And I think that's the key that we're kind of dancing around is literally dancing around. Um, did you like that pun? Uh, 
but it is about using your body to, to be able to kind of break through that very narrow path that, that you only see this one way, right? When we can, when we can start to use our bodies in a different way than we have been in whatever way that is, uh, we actually do start to access different resources. Um, and then we're able to start to see different um, outcomes or different ways to get there. And then I think that's how that empowerment starts. Uh, the ball rolling is when we can kind of step out of ourselves when we don't know what to do, right? Move, um, move your body in some way and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I want to talk more about that, but I also want to side note about what you said, Kim, about the entrepreneurial journey. I always joke and, but with seriousness is that it is a shamanic journey there's no roadmap. You have to go in and you have to lean into your fear. But but when you do lean into the fear, the fear dissolves and you do become empowered on the other side. But it is just, it's not, it's not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's just not. It's not. No. It's not pretty, but it's beautiful. It's kind of like it's, childbirth. <laughs> yeah. It's a beautiful mess. It's a beautiful totally. mess. Totally. Yeah. And, you know, I love what you were speaking to, Louise, about the body. And I, I often think about the body as a microcosm of what your the bigger life is, right? And this mantra that my teacher ingrained in me, you know, over 20 years ago is how you do anything is how you do everything. And so when you can get, you know, at that time I was taking yoga. So what you were doing on that mat, whether it was here in your brain or what you're, how you're moving on your mat and your physical body is some sort of reflection of what you're doing out there with others, within relationship to the world. And so when we can look at that and we can see, ooh, when I go ahead, I'll use the example of yoga, is if I'm trying to get into an inversion and go upside down and I'm just forcing my way through it, I'm gonna get upside down, right? You have this death grip, right? You're probably doing that too outside and you're probably forcing other people and you're forcing yourself into shapes um, into positions, into um, goals that aren't actually meant for you yet. Not to say that they're never, but they might not be ready. You might not be ready for you yet. So you have to take a step back. And on that mat, you go, let me breathe here. Let me see how I can align with this vision of going upside down, right? How can I try a different approach? How can I just take a step back rather than kicking myself up and falling over and Right? Like, how can I take this really truly as a step-by-step -step approach? And when we do that, like you said so beautifully, then you, you really do take that out into your life and say, okay, I see how it's forcing situation here. How can I breathe with it? How can I approach it and see it from a different angle and maybe see an alternative way of going about things? And that's, that's why I truly am so passionate about uh, somatic work, whether it be yoga, whether it be the practice that I have you know, the modality that I've been sharing with people or, or anything, right? If you're being physically um, in your body and you're aware of it, you know, in a way that's, that's all yoga, that's all somatic awareness. Yeah. It's so funny because I use, I, I don't, I mean, I could use yoga as an example because I, instead of jamming it and forcing it, I phone it in because I'm like, oh, I can't do that. And so like, I, I immediately yeah. go to the modification um, so yes, I could use that as an example. I go to, um, particularly if I'm working with somebody who I know has children, I, I go to that. Well, how do you show up in that way for your kids? Because mm -hmm. so often people don't see what they're doing in work or in their businesses is the same way that they're showing up with their kids or that something that their children are doing and they're doing it success, like they're parenting successfully, they haven't switched over and done it with their teams. And it's like, you're not a different person. Mm -hmm. You're, you're just not, you are the same person, just different circumstances. Mm -hmm. And it's all a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. A relationship with ourselves, a relationship with work, with what we do with our, right. With others. It's, it's the same. And I love that reminder. And I've heard that before, right? How, how we how we do this thing is how we do everything, right? How we do anything is how we do everything. 
And, and I really do love that reminder. Um, I think the next time I'm on the yoga mat doing my physiotherapy, uh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be paying attention to like what I'm doing, uh, what my mindset is. Am I forcing it? Am I phoning it in? Am I saying, right? What, what is it that is really happening? Um, I think the yoga mat is a great place to kind of explore that and say, where, where are some like micro changes that I can make even on my mat in my, in my physio to, to kind of bring forward and, and I wonder what those changes will be. Great yeah. Good experience, okay. an experiment for next week. It is a good experiment. Yeah. I, it's one that I've been in it's, and it is funny that you mentioned that because I have been, I did notice that I wasn't being, I wasn't seeing the change that I wanted to see. And I was like, well, yeah, because you're defaulting to modifying because you're too afraid and so sure you're not going to be able to get into that position. And while I may not be able to get into the same position because of you know, my body type is different than the instructor's body type, everybody's body type is different than everybody else's, it's, I can do something differently. And so that's where I've been experimenting is, oh, well, maybe I don't use the block on that setting or not at all, maybe, and see what happens when I move into that. And, oh, what is it telling me that that position is always more challenging? It's not that there's something wrong with me. It's that there's an opportunity to explore what can I, not what can I make easier for myself, but what can I change slightly to improve this over time. So, yeah. So I just looked and we just spent 45 minutes going to some amazing places. I am so curious, what are those golden nuggets? What are those really special moments that we're going to put in our pockets and take with us today? Ooh. Just being with you too. <laughs> that's a, that's a golden nugget. Um, I really love this conversation. I loved all of the aspects of the conversation, but where we just landed to is, is my sweet spot. So I love when we dig into what, how you do anything is how you do everything. But that, just to add one more thing to it is when we're looking at that and we're seeing what, what that conversation is here in our brain to talk about the relationship, like you spoke of Kim, like are you talking to yourself like you would talk to your a little child, like an innocent child or your best friend who you love dearly, right? So that's something just to observe too. Um, I just love dancing around in the conversation that I was able to do that with the two of you so fluidly and beautifully. It's my spark for the day. Yeah, it was a great conversation. I love how we kind of pulled it all together and really, I mean, right, talked about like getting through from entitlement to in empowerment um, is I, I think that 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 for me, it's that right to passage. And even for myself, right? Where is my rite of passage? Where am I, right? Maybe feeling a little bit entitled or what, uh, you know, I'm deserving of. Um, and then how do I take that um, maybe to the yoga mat or to, to moving so that I can, can create that bridge uh, into empowerment. Um, but yeah, I love it. I loved our conversation today. Absolutely. For me, it was that idea of entitlement is really about giving away our power. I speak so much about reclaiming our power and this idea that entitlement is yet another way that we're giving it away. It was really, that was my aha spark today. And I am going to be doing some noodling and probably some writing on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Phoebe, where can people find you in the world if they want to connect more? Yeah, well, I'm on social media in terms of Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn, not as active but I, as I should be. Um, <laughs> okay. But yeah, my name, Phoebe Leona. Uh, Instagram is phoebeleona.love. And my website, I have multiple websites, but we're going to use the nomadcollective.org. Uh, that is where I hang out the most these days. But you can find the modality that we just hinted on, Movement 109 goes through there. And for me personally, Phoebe Leona website is there too. So yeah, come hang out. 
Lovely. She's an amazing person to hang out with. I get to do it on a regular basis, which is fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yay. Louise, hey, I'm going to spring it on you. Do you know what we're talking <laughs> about are. next week? Yes, of course I do. It's Kaylee. <laughs> Did it sound like I knew what I was talking about? Because you really did spring that on me. I uh, did. Sometimes we do our schedule so far in advance that I just forget who's next. Um, but I can't wait to meet Kaylee. Because uh, like Phoebe, uh, sometimes I am just coming in blind. Uh, and uh, don't we don't get to talk or meet uh, some of these folks before we, we get to chat. But uh, Phoebe, it was a great conversation with you today. Um, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure meeting you. Oh, it's such a pleasure meeting you two and being with the both of you. Phoebe, my thank you for making full. the time. Oh my yeah. gosh, it was wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for making the time. And all of our listeners, thank you for making the time to join us live or catching us on the replay. We really appreciate all of you for everything that you're doing in the world. See you later. Absolutely. Take care. Bye for now. Bye.